What's that? Oh, uh, he is not here today. Is he okay? Yeah, he's, he's fine. He's fine. Yeah, he's just not here today, so. <laughs> I guess so. I think he's actually up in Tennessee right now, so. He may be sleeping, I'm not sure. Is it his job? That's where I'm going for my birthday. Oh, for real? Yeah, it's very pretty up here in Tennessee. And I like to put his um, hand on the lights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I agree. Everybody, good morning. Um, welcome from Dr. George Anderson's living room. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Good morning. <laughs> hey, thank you guys for tuning in as well. If you are watching online, we are so glad, uh, and, and, and not just saying that, we are so glad that you really are watching this morning. Um, we say this all the time. Um, there's a reason why God had you get up this morning, and, and you are going to hear the message this morning in the worship. God has a word for you specifically, and um, that's why we're so glad that you're here. Uh, so We're so glad everybody's here this morning. So um, if you would, if you are online, if you would press the share button, get, get the word out, let everybody know about service this morning. And uh, before we get started, we're going to pray, and we'll get started. So Jesus, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you so much for the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we never ever ever forget the cross because that's that's why we're here god you you shed your blood so that we may live and have life eternally and um, not only that you died but you also rose again jesus and that's just what separates you from any and everything else in this world um, you have conquered death in the grave and uh, you continue to do that um, in, in us as well and through us so father as we worship this morning may the words not just be songs that we're singing on the screen but lord let it be the overflow of our hearts let us sing praise and worship to you this morning and god as george opens up the word i pray that uh, holy spirit you would speak directly through him to our hearts here in this living room and also online lord that we would get a word from you and that you would touch us you would fill up our cups overflow our cups this morning you are worthy of all the praise and glory and honor and all god's people said Amen. Y'all stand with me. We're gonna we're gonna sing.
We'll go ahead and turn to uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And <clears throat> I'll announce, make an announcement, I only know of one right now, is that tomorrow morning, guys, at 7 o'clock, we'll be uh, meeting at IHOP for uh, prayer. And so, uh, enjoy, invite you guys to join us. Alright, John chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading... In, uh, in verse 1, John chapter 3, verse 1, There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, and that's a very technical formula that he uses there. Uh, some versions will say, surely, surely. Uh, but I assure you, I promise you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter into the mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, here's that formula again, I assure you, I promise you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. For whatever is born of flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be? asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I assure you, there again, same formula. I promise you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things of heaven? No one has ascended into he heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him, will have eternal life. When I say turn to John chapter 3, some of you uh, may get a little excited. 
But when I say turn to John chapter 3, I get nervous. I'll tell you why. It's the passages of Scripture that we know the best, that we're most familiar with, because they're probably the most important to us. Those are the ones that intimidate me the most. A passage of Scripture that may be a little unfamiliar, I can preach on that. And you almost take my word for it. But if we take a passage of Scripture that everyone is familiar with, and it's like, what can I tell you you don't know? What can I say that you haven't already heard? John began, do a little review, he began with a word of personal testimony. He declared that Jesus is the Word of God, the Logos of God. He is the autobiography of God. He is the authorized version of God. And then he followed that with John the Baptist's testimony, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He followed that up with his first miracle, which he called a sign, which was Jesus turning the water into wine. And the wine represents the best. It represents the Lord Jesus. And then he followed that up with Jesus' passion for the temple. We see him, see him clearing out the temple. Zeal for God's house has consumed me. Then, now, there are four conversations. The first conversation is with a rabbi, Nicodemus. He represents the upper echelons of Jewish society. These are the ones everyone looks up to and admires and respects. And then he goes from there to a conversation with a Samaritan, and not just a Samaritan, who was an outcast, by the way, but a woman, which made it even worse. Sorry. And then from there, he goes to a conversation with a Gentile official who has a sick son. And then finally he goes to... <laughs> And then finally he goes to a conversation with a paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. So we're going to look at that first conversation, the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And there are three points on the outline. You have a copy of it. Those of you who are at home watching, uh, you can follow along and it will be on the screen behind me. Point number one is this. We're going to look at the researcher. Okay, We're going to look at this person who came to Jesus at night because apparently, obviously, he didn't want to draw any attention to himself. Verse 1, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one could perform these signs that you do unless God were with him. The name Nicodemus is actually a Greek name. He was a Jewish man with a Greek name. Wealthy Jewish families could do that. And his name means literally conqueror of the people. Conqueror of the people. A ruler of the people. It says that he was a Pharisee. What does that mean? He was of the conservative religious class. He was serious. He was booga booga. <laughs> he was one of, the, um, one of the best. He was devout. He was a religious man. He was a ruler of the Jews, it says, meaning that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 70 Jewish elders who were the political body of the Jews, their ruling body, meaning he was a politician. He had a lot of influence. And he came at night. Why did he come at night? Obviously because he, he wanted to come under the cloak of darkness so that he would not be seen, so that no one would know that he was coming to Jesus because he wanted to avoid what would happen if they saw him. There, the next day there would be a Twitter storm of people saying, distinguished rabbi visits upstart sign-working sensation Jesus. 
And that wouldn't have been good for his rep. So he came under darkness, a cover of darkness. And he addressed Jesus, notice, as an equal. What did he call him? Rabbi. And then his purpose is, I believe, he came in a fact-finding mission, but he wasn't alone. He said, what? He didn't say, I know. He said, we know. He used the plural. So there were others that may not have been with him, but they were backing him, and they were curious to know about this young miracle worker. That's the man, the researcher, number two, on your outline, the requirement. He gives a new requirement. Look in verse 3. Jesus replied, I assure you, I promise you, Nicodemus, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here's this religious guy who checks all the boxes. And Jesus says to this guy, unless Nicodemus, you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus said. But how can anyone be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, and actually in the Greek, uh, the definite article, the, is not there. Water and spirit, almost as though he's combining those two. They're together. What, together, Water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Who, whatever is born of the flesh, that is physical, is physical. Whatever is born of the spirit, spiritual, is spiritual. Do not be amazed that I told you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. And that's true. We can't see the wind. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be? Nicodemus asked. Get this. Before Nicodemus came as a researcher, he came to find out who this Jesus is. And he's not alone. There are others. They want to know. We want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Who is this Jesus? And before Jesus, before he can hardly get the question out of his mouth, Jesus doesn't even answer the question. Because he jumps to the main point. And what is that? Nick, listen to this. Listen. Nick, you think you want to know who I am. You think you want to know who I am. You come here to check me out because you think you want to know who I am. But Nick, are you really ready for the answer? You see, at this time in their history, uh, messianic expectations were running high. They were, they were expecting the Messiah to show up at any moment. They were looking for Him. But here's the question. Were they ready for him. And Nicodemus' response reveals they were nowhere close to ready. Are you ready for the answer? I know what you're looking for. But are you prepared for the answer? That's a good question, isn't it? What are you looking for? But are you prepared for the answer? Sometimes we pray and we ask God for things and God doesn't come through. God doesn't, seemingly, God doesn't offer, answer our prayers and then suddenly, you know, something happens and God comes through and God does something and we're like, this is God's answer, but it wasn't the answer what you expected, was it? Sometimes God has to prepare us for the answer. Right now, there are a lot of people praying for revival. Uh, Franklin Graham is calling for Christians to descend on Washington, D.C. September the 26th. And I believe that, I believe that there's going to be an overwhelming response to that request. I, I, I've never had a desire to want to go to Washington, D.C. for any kind of a march, but I would love to be there for that one because I think there are going to be millions of people who are going to descend on Washington, D.C., 
I, I think there will be other protesters who will be there, but I believe they're just going to be, they're just going to disappear. Because there are going to be so many believers who are going to descend on Washington, D.C. Because Franklin Graham is calling us to prayer, to pray for a nation, to pray for healing, and to pray for revival. I don't think I've ever seen a time when people were, were, were more concerned, more desirous of revival than they've ever been than right now. And maybe that's you. Are you praying for revival? But I want to ask you a question. Are you ready for the answer? Are you ready for the answer? We think we are. Because in our minds, we have this idea of what it's going to look like when it comes. Church is going to be full. Altar is going to be full. Singing is going to be glorious. Preaching is going to be powerful. That's what it's going to look like. You know, I read the book of Acts. And what happened in the book of Acts, if that were to happen today, it would blow our minds. I was raised a Methodist. As a 16-year-old boy, I was saved in a Southern Baptist church. I have certain, I know, I was, I was trained in a Southern Baptist college and seminary and I pastored Southern Baptist churches and most of my friends have been Southern Baptist. But I want to ask you a question. This is what I've been thinking about this week. This is kind of what I've been dealing with in my own heart. If God were to show up like He did in the book of Acts, think about it. If He showed up like He did in Acts, when, when the Spirit fell on people and they started speaking in tongues, what would we do? It would blow our minds. This isn't Southern Baptist. This isn't what we expect. Now, as I say, am I saying that's what is going to happen? I have no idea what's going to happen when God shows up. But what I am saying is, when it does happen, when God shows up, are we really ready for it? You know, I think we just have to come to a place where we say, God, I'm willing to just let you be God. I'm willing to just let you do whatever you want to do. Do your thing. And that's okay with me. It may be outside my comfort zone. It may be outside my box. But that's okay. Because He's God. We have to let Jesus be Lord. That's what revival is. Are we ready for that? Jesus is going to talk about what's required. For kingdom citizenship, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. What were Jews looking for? And let's just go inside Nicodemus' mind. The average Jew thought this, that the kingdom of God was going to be out there in the future. It's out there in the future, and it involved... A transformation of the world, of the planet. And Jews were a lock for it. If you were a Jew, unless you were a Jew and a really, really bad person, it was a given you were going to be there. And Jews were going to be sort of catapulted to this place of world prominence once again. But Jesus comes along and Jesus gives a totally different de description of the kingdom of God. To Jesus, what was the kingdom? To Jesus, the kingdom is not future. It is not out there. It is now. It is here. And it doesn't involve a transformed planet. The kingdom of God, listen to me, it involves a transformed people. And only born again people are going to be there. You don't mind circling your, a word in your Bible. Circle the word unless. Boy, that's a descriptive word. That is a word that narrows it down, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus was talking not just to a Jew, but a good Jew, a religious Jew. And Jesus said to this man, male, religious, Jesus said to this man, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. How dare He? 
Jesus was saying in effect, everyone, everyone thinks they're going to heaven. Everyone thinks they're going to be in the kingdom. Nicodemus, you think you're going to be there. But unless you are born again, you're not going. Nick checked all the boxes. But the question is, are you born again? Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're going to miss it. Capiche? And the problem was with Nicodemus was, no, he didn't capiche. But Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, there is nothing more important than this. Nothing more than important than this. This is life and death. This is heaven and hell. If you miss this, you're going to miss salvation. And by the way, just as kind of an aside, I hear people ask sometimes, Pastor, do you think we should evangelize the Jews? What do you think Jesus was doing? Nicodemus wasn't just a Jew. He was the best representative of Judaism. And Jesus was trying to evangelize this guy. So Jesus, because Nicodemus didn't understand, he tried to explain. Now there are three letters on your outline. A, B, C. And let me give you these. Letter A is source. Jesus is going to give Nicodemus the source of what does it mean, new birth? What's the source of the new birth? Where does it begin? What is the origin? Look at verse 3. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some of you may have a different translation that says, unless one is born from above. Born again, born above. Which one is right? Both of them are true. What is he saying? If you're going to be born from above, only God can do that. This isn't something we do for ourselves. This, listen, this isn't a bottom-up salvation. This, this isn't something that we somehow or another climb ourselves up the ladder to God. This is not a bottom-up. This is a top-down salvation. Only God can do this. God is the source of of this salvation, or letter B, the agency of this salvation. Verse 4, but how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked, can he enter his mother's womb a second time? Nicodemus, listen, do you, do you know what that, when Jesus was saying this, do you know what that whooshing sound was? That was what Jesus was saying going right over Nicodemus' head. Whoosh! Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water and Spirit, what does that mean? Be honest with you, that's been something that's been a question in my own mind. What did Jesus mean by water and Spirit? Let's take water first. Spirit's kind of obvious, but, but what, is, what does He mean by water? Well, there are a lot of different ideas about that presented by different scholars. Some say that the water represents physical birth. Physical birth. Because when a child is born, the ambionic fluid. Water. Physical birth. Some people believe it referred to baptism. Baptism. The way you're saved is you're baptized Save you. Right, listen, you can be baptized so many times that you know every trout in the stream by first name. It ain't going to get you into heaven, okay? Water doesn't save. And there's some people who believe that it refers to the spiritual cleansing, that somehow or another you've got to go through this process where you get cleaned up first before you come to Him. You're putting the cart in front of the horse. You don't get clean until after you come to Him. You can't get yourself clean. Only God the Holy Spirit can clean you up after He comes in your life. But, so what is water? What does it represent? I'll tell you what I think. My opinion is it represents the Word of God. So where do you get that from, Brother George? Romans chapter 1, verse 16. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. It says this, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel. Why? 
For it is, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And the Spirit, I believe, obviously refers to the Holy Spirit. What he's saying here is these two things, it's, it's not, these are two different things, two separate things, but he puts them together. Water and, and Spirit, Word and Spirit. I tell you, that's how God works and affects salvation in our life. God the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and He convicts us of our lostness through His Word and He convinces us that the way to be saved and the only way to be saved is through Faith in Jesus Christ. And that produces, that inspires, it motivates us to make a response, to put our faith in Christ, and that's what saves us. Letter C is the result. Look at verse 6. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from. When I read that, I think about it as a boy growing up in Sarah Land and how I'd ride my horse out into Nall's pastures. And there was a pasture back there. And uh, at the back of, uh, there were several pastures, but the back pasture, we'd ride our horse out there, and we would tie our horses off to a branch or a fence, and then we'd just, I would just lay back in the grass and look up and I'd watch the wind blowing the clouds and the breeze blowing the grass. You can't see the wind, can you? But you can see what it does, right? You can see what it does. Jesus said, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. There is a law called the law of homogeneity. It has nothing to do with sexual orientation, by the way. Homogeneity just simply may, means this, like produces like. Kind produces kind, same kind. Dogs produce dogs. Cats produce cats. And if anybody wants to take one with you when you leave here, you're welcome to. <laughs> cows produce cows. Horses produce horses. And human beings produce human beings. Dogs don't produce cats. Cows don't produce horses. And people don't produce cats. Like kind produces like kind. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Flesh, physical, produces physical. Spiritual produces spiritual. And listen, and only spiritual can produce spiritual. You know, I hear people say sometimes, you say, are you a Christian? They'll say, I've always been a Christian. Well, when did you become a Christian? You don't understand. I've always been a Christian. So does that mean that when you were born, you just popped out a Christian? You just contradicted what Jesus said. Because flesh doesn't produce spirit. Physical doesn't produce spiritual. Only spiritual produces spiritual. Well, but you, that's, that's, not what I, that, that's not what I mean. I mean, I've always believed in God. You know there's a difference between believing in God and being born again? The Bible says in James 2, verse 19, the demons believe and they tremble. When is the last time you thought about God and believed in God so much you got all shook up? Demons believe and tremble, but they're not born again. They're not going to be in heaven. The question is, not do you believe, but have you been born again? Listen, being born physically is a real experience. Amen? I mean, I was there three times when my children were born. It was real. And being born again is also a real experience. Being born physically produces a creature. Being born again produces a new creature. Paul said, new creation in Christ Jesus. Physical birth is something you can prove, can't you? 
Can't you prove it? Will Rogers, the American humorist, was going somewhere one time. And he was going through the airport and he had to go through check, check in and they asked him for his passport and he said, why? And the lady said, I need proof of your birth. And Will Rogers said, I'm here, ain't I? Physical birth is something you can prove, can't you? Spiritual birth is also something you should be able to prove. Well, how can I do that? Listen, Jesus said, you don't, listen, you don't control the wind, do you? You don't. You don't control the wind, and you don't control the Holy Spirit of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't control the Holy Spirit. I remember one time scheduling an evangelist to come and preach at our church and we scheduled a meeting. We put it down on the calendar and I can remember him saying to me, we're going to have a Holy Ghost. We had a good revival. But I tell you what, you don't put a date on the calendar and control when the Holy Spirit's going to show up. Okay? He's God. The Holy Spirit, get this, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is God. And He shows up where and when He wants to show up. You don't control God. You don't control the Holy Spirit. But you can see the wind, can't you? You may not can see it, but you see what it does. And you can see, you may not see the Holy Spirit, but I'll tell you, you can see it when He shows up. It's unmistakable. It is undeniable. Just like a guy saying to me one time, I remember witnessing this guy in Mobile or in Pensacola, Florida, who lived on a sailboat. He was an engineer. And uh, we were talking uh, about the church, and he had not been in church in years. And, uh, but he at one time had been very involved in church. And I remember him saying, I remember him sitting in the cockpit of that sailboat and he, he got a, 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 like this wistful look in his eyes like, like he could see something in his past, in his experience that I couldn't see. But it was like he was looking at it and he said this, he said, I've been there when the Spirit of God showed up. And I'll tell you what, they man talks about nuclear power and atomic power. I'll tell you, it is dishwater compared to the power of God when God shows up. And I'm like, man, give me some of that. It may not look like what I thought it was going to look like, but I'm okay with that. I just don't want to miss it. But the evidence of what is what? When this changed lives. Changed lives. Harry Ironside was uh, many years ago a great pastor, pastor of Moody Church in Chicago. And um, he, uh, I, I think if, if you were to make a list of the, what, the 100 greatest preachers that the United States of America has ever produced, Moody or, or Ironside would have to be in the top 20, maybe even the top 10. His commentaries are still today extremely popular. He just had a way of bringing the Word of God and just putting it in language that it's easy to understand. Ironside, before he was Pastor Moody, he was <clears throat> working for a Christian organization in San Francisco. And he was walking down the street and he came to the corner of Market Street and Grant Avenue. And there's a group of people that would, had gathered there. And he stood there for a moment and he listened. It was obvious from the way they were dressed and what they were doing, the music they were playing. It was a Salvation Army band having an outdoor street corner meeting. And, and when they saw, Mood, when they saw um, um, Ironside, some people recognized him and they invited him. Dr. Ironside, would you please, would you come up to the platform and say something to us? And Ironside stood up and he gave his testimony. And he noticed there was a well-dressed man kind of standing out on the periphery of the, of, of the group. And he was, took out a card and began to write something on it. And Ironside 
said, as soon as he got through speaking, this man came through the crowd. He came up to Ironside, and he, and he handed him that card. And he said, Mr. Ironside, I am. And he told him his name, and Ironside looked at his card, and it was a business card, and his name was on the business card. And he recognized that he was one of the, he was most, one of the most well-known agnostics in America at that time. He'd written books, and he spoke at different uh, um, meetings. Very well-known. And he said to Ironside, he said, next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'm going to be at the uh, scientific convention hall here in San Francisco, and I would like to invite you, Dr. Ironside, to come and have a debate with me. And we will debate the tenets of Christianity and agnosticism. And Ironside was still on the platform, and he held up the card, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished gentleman here has invited me to a debate, uh, to debate uh, agnosticism versus Christianity, and it will be next Sunday at the Scientific Hall at 4 o'clock. And, 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 and I, I, honestly, I want you to know, I already have something scheduled for 3 o'clock next Sunday afternoon, but I can move it where I can be there. And if I can't move it, I'll just get a substitute to speak for me because I really want to be at this, at this debate. But I, but I have one condition. And he looked at this man and he said, Sir, I only have one condition. One condition. He said, I want you to go find two people. Find a man and a woman. Find you a man who once lived a debauched life. Somebody who was an alcoholic, a drug addict, a criminal who came to one of your meetings and heard you talk about agnosticism and it changed his life. And he went away from there and said, I am a different man because I am now an agnostic and it changed his life. And now he is, a, he is an upstanding citizen and a contributing member of society. Bring that man. And then I want you to bring a woman. I want you to bring a woman who at one time was, was the same, living a very low life. Maybe she was a drug addict. Maybe she was a prostitute. And, but, but she came and she heard you speak on agnosticism, and she said, I'm going to be an agnostic, and it changed her life, and it brought her up. And today, she is a, she is a lady, and she is respected. And I want you to bring those two people to the meeting. And he said, and, and, and just to be fair, I will bring people too. I'll bring a hundred. I'll bring a hundred whose lives have been changed by the preaching of the gospel. He turned to the person that was, or he would organize this outdoor meeting who happened to be a lady of the Salvation Army, and he said, do you reckon there's anybody here who, who might would fit that description? She said, there are at least 40 here. We'll be at the meeting. Their lives have been changed. They fit the description. They were living in, 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 in debauchery. They were living, they were alcoholics. They were drug addicts. They were prostitutes. But they heard the gospel and they gave their life to Jesus and their life was changed. And now they're living for Him. And he said, I can bring at least 40. And Ironside said, well, I can find at least 60 more. And he looked at this man and he said, I'm only asking you to bring two and I'll bring a hundred. And he said the man must have had a sense of humor because he looked at Ironside and he tipped his hat and he smiled and he said he didn't see him again after that. Because he disappeared. Because I'll tell you, you know, atheism has never produced a, a hospital. Atheism has never produced a retirement home. There are no retirement homes for atheists. The devil doesn't have any happy old people. I know them. I don't know all of them, but the ones I know, they ain't happy. Now, I'll say this. We're not everything we ought to be either. Amen? But, but I've known people whose lives have been changed by the gospel. And then Jesus gives him a rebuke. Let me try and hurry. Verse 9, how can these things be, asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel, Jesus said, and you don't know this? Nicodemus, this is, this is, this is first grade stuff, okay? You heard about this when you were knee high to a locust in synagogue school. You heard about these things. You don't understand these things. 
I assure you we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe or accept if I tell you about things of heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, which would be Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life what jesus was saying to nicodemus is nicodemus you should have seen this you should know this you should understand this you should have expected this to happen but he was he was he was raised never to question his salvation because he was a jew he was programmed by his upbringing <clears throat> not to ask programmed not to see it and i look at that and i wonder are there some things we're missing because we've been programmed brother george i don't have to read my bible all i got to do is just listen to you i trust you brother george i trust you to tell me the truth I hope you never say that. I hope you can trust me. But I hope you know that I can be wrong. Hopefully it's accidental and never intentional. We said, Brother George, I believe we're living in the last days. Do you believe we're living in the last days? You know one of the evidences of the last day when the Antichrist and the false prophet come along? People are going to believe them. Why? Because they've been programmed to do so. But I tell you what we need to do. If these really are the last days and you really believe that, we better get our defenses up. You better get the wall up. You hear me? Do you hear me? Do you see me? We better get the wall up. I'm talking about the Word of God to protect us. What is man's greatest need? His greatest need, his greatest problem. His greatest need is forgiveness because his greatest problem is sin. And Jesus took care of that. How? At the cross when he was lifted up, he paid for our sins. But what is man's greatest longing? What is man's greatest desire? Let me tell you this, and you may be surprised. It is the kingdom of God. Well, Brother George, I know people that don't know God, they don't go to church, and they, can, they don't give a foot about the kingdom of God. Yes, they do. They just don't know it. Let me explain to you. Look at this verse of Scripture. Romans 14, verse 17. I think I got it right here. Look at what it says. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. But what is it? But it is righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. Even this old boy out there, that he doesn't know God. <clears throat> from a clay biscuit. But I can tell you what he wants. He wants to know, how can I be a better person? He wants peace. Isn't that what our world is desperately searching for right now? For peace? The streets of Chicago, the streets of Seattle, the streets of New York. People are looking for peace. And people are looking for joy. What are they looking for? They're looking for the Kingdom of God and don't know it. Listen, our greatest need is forgiveness because our greatest problem is sin. And our greatest longing is the kingdom of God. It is righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Jesus solved our greatest problem by going to the cross and being lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Listen, you know the story. How that the children of Israel were all doing, they were they had to have been a bunch of Baptists. I know they were, because all they wanted to do was just gripe and whine and complain and were complaining about the food and were complaining about the desert. And they came to a place right on the border of Petra and they were saying, Where is God? Were there not enough graves and cemeteries in Egypt that we couldn't just die and be buried there? Did God bring us out here to be buried in these trenches in the desert? And God was up. And so God sent a plague of these serpents, fiery serpents. It 
doesn't mean there were red snakes. It meant when they bit you, it felt like fire going through your body. And the people began to cry out. And they came to Moses and said, Moses, please intervene for us. Intercede for us. Go to God and beg Him for mercy. And Moses did. And God said, Moses, I want you to take a piece of, of, of brass and I want you to hammer it and I want you to make it into the image of one of these snakes and then I want you to lift it up on a pole and it is so absolutely ridiculous what God said. God said, look at it and you will be healed. We live in a day where we know that looking at something isn't what heals you. You go to the doctor. You get a shot. You get medicine. You go to the hospital. You get an IV. All you do is you just look. Why? Because God was just trying to tell them, you look to Me in faith. You look to Me in faith. You look to God in faith and you will be healed. And people did that and they were healed. But do you know, do you believe there were people there who wouldn't do it? It's too easy. It can't be that simple. And they missed it because they wouldn't look. Nicodemus is like, how can this happen? How can you do this? And Jesus was like, Nick, you came to me and you said, nobody can do what you do unless what? Unless God is with him. And he says, how, how can this happen? How can this happen? And Jesus is like, Nicodemus, Wow! You don't get it? It's the same answer. It's God. With man, it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. Listen to me. Being born again is not automatic. You're not born again because you're born in a Christian family. You're raised in a Christian home. You go to church. You started church nine months before you're born there in the nursery. That's not how you become a Christian. Becoming a Christian is a matter of a decision that you make to put your faith in Jesus. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you are born again. The question is, are you born again? Nicodemus was a good man. And Jesus said, unless this happens to you, you're going to miss it. John Patton was a missionary to Hebrides Islands. And he, was, uh, he got there and the, the natives there, nobody understood their language and they didn't have a written language. And one of his first objectives was he wanted to put the Bible... He wanted to record the Bible translated in a language that the natives of the Hebrides Islands could understand. And so, slowly he began to do that. You know, he began to befriend people, began to learn the language. He began to write, translate the Bible in their language. But he got hung up on one word, Rick. One word. Faith. How are you going to write the Bible without a word for faith? So he and one of his native friends had been out hunting and they shot a big old deer. And they tied his legs together and they put a pole between his legs and they hoisted it up over their shoulders and they're carrying that deer back to their camp. And it was a long way back to the camp. And when they finally got to the camp, they just kind of exhausted, just kind of dropped that pole, that deer off of their shoulders. And he said the guy that was with him, the native, just kind of went, man, it sure is good to just fall back and rest. Say, what is the word for that? And he said, "What well, in our language the word is, and guess what the word was for faith in that Bible? It was the worth word for just to fall back and rest. How is a person saved? How is a person born again? It is falling back on the promise of God that Jesus was lifted up for our sins and He paid the penalty for our sins. And on the third day, God affirmed it by raising Him from the dead. And so now what do we do? We don't pull ourselves up. What we do is we just put our faith in what Jesus has done. And when you do that, you're saved. Let's pray. Father, I thank You that uh, You cared enough about me cared enough about me to meet my need. That even when I was a sinner, You loved me so much that Christ died for me. 
And I thank you that you have given me the gift of eternal life, not because of what I've done, not because the sermons I've preached or the churches that I've pastored, but because of what Jesus did for me on the cross and my faith in Him. And God, what astounds me is anybody can do that. Anybody listening to me right now can do that. It is not, it doesn't take much effort. It doesn't take a probation. All it takes is just a decision. Simple, childlike faith decision to trust Jesus as your Savior. Look and live. Father, I pray that people listening to me would do that today. That everyone hearing my voice right now and who will hear this message has done that and that they have not. Then God, I pray that you would produce the faith in their hearts and the desire to make this decision in Jesus' name. And our heads bowed and our eyes and closed. And I just want to ask you, have you been born again? I'm not asking you if you're a good person or religious or a church member. I'm not asking you if you're moral. I'm asking you, have you been born again? You see, you can be all that other stuff and miss it. And if you say, Brother George, I haven't, or I don't know, then the good news is you can make a decision right now to put your faith in Christ, to put your trust in Jesus as your Savior. And I promise you, listen, as Jesus made the promise, you will be saved. Why not do that right now? Why not just cry out to Him in your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I ask you to save me. Thank you for dying for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I put my trust in you. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing this prayer and for answering it. In Jesus' name. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, I wish you'd let me know. If you're listening to this uh, on Facebook or YouTube, if you would just uh, message us, send us a message, info at gorhc.org, uh, and just let us know, because we would love to hear. I'll tell you this, if you prayed that prayer, something just happened and your life was changed and i want you to know i didn't do that i didn't produce that only spirit of god can produce that those of you who are hearing who can testify to that you know what i'm talking about and if you're here and you did that same thing it goes for you as well well i'll see you listen guys tomorrow seven o'clock at ihop and um um you know as far as i know we'll be back here 1030 next Sunday. And if not here, we're going to be somewhere. Okay. And if it changes, we'll let you know. Okay. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he be gracious unto you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Thank y'all for being here. Thank y'all for watching and have a great day and stay safe.